Uh, just to be quite clear, what, what we're doing, um, th this relates, well, we're on, we're on to heritage and memory uh, uh, in the session, and this obviously directly relates to the uh, session yesterday afternoon, uh, which obviously uh, not all of you uh, attended, and uh, what, we're of, what we're doing now is um, summing up and taking further the uh, questions that were discussed and hopefully answered at that uh, session. So obviously there were four, four papers, just to remind you uh, what these were, hopefully you've all read them. The paper that Jasper and I uh, wrote, Can Heritage Be Transnationalised? The Implications of Transnational for Memory. And then the paper by uh, Augustus uh, Santos, the, uh, the, the uh, academic state, stakeholder from Porto University. So Augustus over there, uh, on the symbolic politics of cultural heritage. A case study that is related to our paper, uh, a, case, uh, a Portuguese case study. And then in the second session, uh, Dominic Pulo, where's Dominic? Uh, he's, where's Dominic? Oh, there you are, Dominic. Uh, and Dominic's paper is the invention of memories necessary to identities. And the um, academic stakeholder paper, uh, which um, was a summarized version, was, was read out because the author, uh, Holman Mais, uh, wasn't able to come. Uh, so we had at both sessions discussion uh, on those uh, papers, and uh, a number of uh, questions arose. And obviously, we, we are not going to be able to address all of those questions. And, uh, uh, the three of us, uh, uh, Mercedes, we've also met, of course, from Interacts, um, selected three uh, questions, which I hope uh, reflect the um, direction of the discussion. And we're going to ask these questions, and you're going to answer these questions. <laughs> um, and the way we're going to do it is a little bit like the earlier session, something that's highly interactive, uh, with a variation. I know once I sit down on a, on, on, a, on a chair in the afternoon, I hate to get up off it, but I'm afraid we're going to ask you to constitute yourselves into four groups. I know groups don't work, but we're going to uh, put you into groups of four on, on a self-selecting uh, basis, on a self-organizing basis. But, uh, and this is going to be the tricky part, I hope it will work. Uh, we want the, uh, a good relationship between the stakeholders, I know that's uh, a diverse group, and the academics, the team academics and the, the, the um, uh, academic stakeholders. Well, there's only one of those present, I think. No, there's, there's a few more. So there's a good relationship between academic, academics and stakeholders. And uh, secondly, the academics, or at least one of them or two of them, are going to <laughs> ask the questions to the uh, stakeholders. And well, we'll see what answers, because the idea of the session is obviously um, to, to uh, give the stage to the, the stakeholders. And uh, let's hope that works. But just before you move about and organi organize yourself into four groups, uh, Jasper very briefly wants to sum up the general discussion, which is what we're supposed to do. But I, I think it, we don't need to go into this in great detail. And just we'll just say uh, a few things that might hopefully characterize the general trend before we reveal these questions. OK, I'll, I will try and do so in one or two sentences only. Um, I think the emphasis here, when we were looking at the transnationalization of heritage, was to try and attempt to see where the big shifts are. Some of you may be involved directly in the heritage world, and some of you in the cultural arts sector, and only tangentially consider yourselves involved with heritage. But our argument in part is that heritageization is a big part of where culture is going at the moment, in part because there's been a policy response from governments but also, if you look at the individual level, individual citizens increasingly seem to be seeing themselves, their, their identity construction, in terms of constructing a heritage. We could argue about the semantics of linguistic difference, but that would be to take us down another route. So, in thinking about this, Gerard and I were trying to assess what kind of heritage Europe needs. 
where do we need to go with an idea of a collective heritage, or, or can there even be one? And our argument, if you've read the paper, both in the short and the long versions, is essentially that there's a dark European past and history, which is a shared past, and that's what we ought to be uh, dealing with predominantly. But the questions are complex and nuanced and come down also to how post-conflict societies in particular deal with their heritages. And whilst this may seem like something that doesn't apply to a lot of European nations, for a significant number it's a very real issue. And it's one obviously that we will face at some stage when Syria tries to reconstruct itself in some form. Who knows, it might be a multiplicity of states or a single state. Nobody quite knows. But recent analyses of post-conflict countries suggest that memorialization is something governments have to deal with, whether they like it or not. Because if they don't do it, other groups, possibly self-identifying as ethnic groups um, or religious groups, will memorialize that past and cement those differences. And with that in mind, I wanted us, as we split into our groups, to consider one example. One example of heritageization um, during a conflict, effectively, and afterwards. So many of you will be aware of the destruction of the old bridge, Starimost in Mostar, in November 1993 by Croat forces. And this was an attempt to remove a symbol of a heterogeneous mixed identity and to create ethnicized ones. Hugely problematic. What did the international, transnational heritage community want to do? They wanted to rebuild the bridge. And they spent 11 years and a fair amount of money doing so. We could talk about whether that's a good or, or a bad response. But what the Mostari did via a local NGO was to construct their own monument. And their own monument, their own monument they needed post-conflict was a statue of Bruce Lee, the world's very first. So the question I want you to think about as you're aggregating into your different groups is, was this a good choice? And then when you sit down in your groups, just have a, a few minutes just to discuss this first question, which is a kind of prelude to the other three questions, which are more analytical. So if we can break them into groups now and think about Bruce Lee, yeah. that would be fantastic. And then we'll, we'll, we'll ask the first question. I think we, we, we need some explanation well, I, I cannot answer this kind of question because I, I really don't know what kind of people made the, the statue. So, uh, I don't know if uh, other people have the same uh, question, but uh, it's rather un, un, incomprehensible for me, so I cannot answer this. Well, um, I'd, I'll get one of our stakeholders to answer that because Lars has visited the, the site and, ha and knows a little bit about... No, I, I've... I think we could also do without knowledge, but, <laughs> um, but in a conflict situation, if you look for common ground, um, the common ground may be in a very um, surprising realm. And yesterday I was talking about Beyoncé, um, which could maybe also be there in a sculpture. Uh, you know, um, not talking about high or low culture, pop culture or whatever, but that which unifies uh, two conflicting parties is maybe not the obvious heritage that you would look for. So I, I hope that helps a little bit, Dominique. May, may, maybe not, but, um, <laughs> but as I said, this is a prelude question, so this is just to kind of get the juices flowing, thinking about the nature of representation and the risks of representation um, in post-conflict. And Europe actually is a post-conflict continent that's in conflict as, as well in the current, so I don't think we can cut out that part of the identity question. So if we can re-aggregate, that would be fantastic. And again, please uh, make sure that in the groups that you're in those arms are balanced. Was this a good idea? The, just, it's a, it's a pre-question, prefiguring, Gabriele, the, the tougher questions, the meatier questions.
Three questions, and the first one first. Each of, each of the three of us who are running the show will ask a question in turn, and just post the question, and maybe just say a few words on why we're asking the question without um, preempting answers or giving away answers. <laughs> okay. This question, which I'm going to ask, is of course related to the discourse and the problem of Bruce Lee. Sorry if you couldn't hear me. Um, does heritage today only have a dark side? And is this clear as a question? Or does, is it too much of a leading question? If it's too much of a leading question, then I'd like to hear a response as to why we're looking at this issue wrong. Because if we are, then Gerard and I have everything wrong in our paper. Um, so we'd like to hear about it. It could depend on who we're talking to. The word only, in fact, we discussed this earlier, could also be ever. Uh, depending, on who we're, depending on who we're talking, it would be an entirely different question. Um, so, a, a dominant trend in, in, in contemporary thought is to see uh, heritage, especially the European, um, European heritage, but not only in terms of, of the dark side, of looking at the dark side, of course, that's very important, but the word only here. The word only. So that's the question. It's a very clear question, I hope. And you're asked to uh, debate that and uh, come up, hopefully, with some perspectives uh, on it. And once again, the academics should pose the question to the uh, stakeholders. And they should um, try to, uh, first of all, answer the question. And, well, then perhaps we, one can see how the uh, rest of the debate will go for 10 minutes at most. The next one you want me to ask? Yeah, well, is that what we said? What kind the of last one oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Which one did we say? Yeah. Yeah. If you don't mind? No, no, that's, I don't know why I got it wrong there. That's, right. that's what we said. Yes. 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 Yes.
Okay, um, excuse me everybody, we'll be asking for your comments, your reportage on, on what you've been discussing in one minute. So one minute just to finally gather up your thoughts, um, your answer to the question and a point to rapporteur. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for the discussion. I would like us to start with the group at the back, please. Um, Gabriele, Ferdinand, you guys at the back, could we have your answer to the question? Does Heritage Today only have a dark side? I thought you all saw that they gave me the mic, right? The group. Our conversation's far from over, but I would say, I would say that heritage has a dark side when it is imposed and fixed, um, and when it's not, it doesn't necessarily. Well, that's a very short answer. Um, okay. we'll move on. That'll do. You're all in agreement on that one. Any any comments on that? No. Okay, well, that was a very short and sweet. Let's keep it like that. Um, you guys over here, t tell us your, your answer. <laughs> we started to think of examples of uh, monuments. So we restricted to physical monuments in the city, and we spoke about political monuments, like, for example, uh, that usually celebrate the victory of someone, and therefore they celebrate the lot loss of someone else. So there is always a, so it's connected with political history and the winners and the losers. So they all have a double side. But in, we were making the example of places where indeed when there is a revolution or a change of governing power, they destroy the monuments of the previous power in place. And we were saying like, this will be anyway the wrong thing to do. Because though a monument can bring painful memories or painful messages for some groups, still it's worth to take it. So the ideal thing is that we acknowledge the double side value of each monument and we are prepared to read it, read it in, a, in complex ways. But and we put religious monuments on the same side of political monuments. Like, 
uh, because they are also uh, raising some, they can harm. So there is all the question of how monuments can harm someone. I mean, that's an interesting perspective, especially if one thinks of monuments of Tito, who was yes, sort of universally yeah. removed. But now there's a guerrilla re-erection of some statues of Tito in public space by you know, pro-Yugoslavia groups who, who are emergent now. And that's, that's an interesting uh, yeah. new phenomenon. So thank you for that. If we move over to you guys over here. But we, we haven't really discussed about the question, that's the truth. We have been, <laughs> been on Bruce Lee all the time. Okay. <laughs> Just to be honest. That's fine, that's good. But anyway, uh, uh, the minute we have said to that is that if it's only, I think the answer is clearly no. Can you elaborate? Uh, my, my, no, my impression, but we have just talked a little bit about that. There's always have a dark side, but not only. For me, it's very clear. I mean, I don't know really because I, I knew what this meeting, but why only is in the question. Uh, because it's really very excluding word, well, I mean, the, and it, it makes no sense. If we were to look at it historically, we'd look at the, the big yeah. heritage players that have been transnational groups like UNESCO. Yeah. What have they celebrated? Almost exclusively, positively connotated heritage. Yeah. In the past, it was castles and churches. Then yeah. they expand with cultural landscapes to try yeah. and broaden it. Now it's intangible heritage, yes. but it's still predominantly positive. The exceptions have been Auschwitz-Birkenau, yeah. they've been near Genbaku Dome in Hiroshima, yeah. um, Nelson Mandela's prison on Robin Island, but that's yeah. to do with the triumph narrative of South Africa. Yeah. And there have been huge contestation um, in some cases, like the Genbaku Dome, the US withdrew all their funding from UNESCO precisely because there was a position from the international community that we had to have a memorialization of this past. And Europe too, I think, especially with the, the heritage, um, the new heritage regime we have, the authorized heritage discourse, as Laura Jane Smith yes. puts it, um, is again predominantly positively connoted stuff. I don't think that enables Europe to face its past. And this is the argument that, that, that we're making. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the shift, a, a reaction to, to that emphasizes, emphasizes the, the negative aspects which we discussed yesterday and uh, one could draw the conclusion, uh, as we said, that now heritage is only about the, the dark side of history, the yeah. negative uh, aspects of history, violence and suffering of, of minorities, the, 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 the predominant uh, image uh, now being that of the Holocaust and uh, various... Uh, commemorating the, uh, the, the crimes of the past. Uh, so then things go the other way, and uh, that is the background to, to, to this question. We were just saying something, we were doing, being good boys and girls, and we were discussing the first question, which was what we would do with this statue. So uh, we, we, we thought, does Heritage Day only have a dark side? No, does it ever have a dark side? Yes, always. And so we thought that really interesting to us was how in a gendered group like ours, three of us could totally relate and read off uh, the statue, and the two ladies couldn't at all. We were absolutely baffled, because none of us had ever seen anything by Bruce Lee. The only time I really r registered Bruce Lee was five years ago, when I walked along Beijing Airport, and there was a half a mile of a Bruce Lee exhibition, which he says he was involved in, in, in setting up. So what we were talking about was, you know, um, of course, the uh, you know, the, 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 the statue, it is a, a way of uh, creating an identification from an outside in a, in a, in a deeply divisive and horrendous uh, impossibility to memorize something of the past and creating a symbol that is then imported and that uh, people can relate to because the people who were fighting were probably, you know, as you said, they were probably men and... Uh, so in that sense, it was gendered. It, but it also had a sort of comic element of distancing um, and uh, absurdity. So f f for us, for the two of us, we were just uh, looking at it and he said, why? What are they doing there? So I wondered whether other women in the room had a similar response because we had some Bruce Lee fans amongst yeah, the well, others. That's a good question. Can we have a hands up if other women felt the same way? Okay, okay, so the, the, there's a gender element here. I mean, gender discourse. <laughs> absolutely a symbol of Well, that's the male perspective that we all prove. No, no, from our group. Yeah. No, I don't disagree with you. It's a powerful symbol, so it's not just around gender.
Well, then maybe I can ask NASA just to add something. Can very I interesting. He just was follow up on that point? Nikos. So we, this is precisely the point we we're saying because from the Balkans, which would have also read Bruce Lee in precisely in that way, because the Balkan societies, even if you're hegemonic, still see yourself in a subaltern perspective. So the Balkan internalization of Bruce Lee also was from the underdog perspective. And what we found fascinating was Lars's um, point that if you look for the common ground, it may take you not in the middle point where there's compromise and a dilution of the both halves, but a displacement effect. So you end up pushing each of you to a fantasy point which is outside of your own paradigm. And we thought this was particularly pertinent given the fact that as, sorry, your name again? As Pepe says, when you, if you try to find compromise from within your national or ethnic symbolic er, repertoire, you might not find things that you like, let alone things that you want to venerate. So that imaginary displacement effect, ridiculous as it may well have been, is also a way of giving you space to rehumanize yourself at the very point when you've come to the edges of dehumanization. And, um, and we felt that was a really kind of powerful way of thinking of the ambivalence of heritage, the only and ever, the dark and the light side. So there is a deep ambivalence and displacement effect that uh, we thought this sculpture actually stimulated and, uh, and was actually, we also thought, masculinist as it may well have been in that particular context, did nevertheless pre present us with a kind of collective wisdom in the decision making. Thank you for that. I think something that's going to be of will we'll expand this subaltern agency of, of Bruce Lee. Yes, yes uh, during the 70s, uh, you have a Cold War between Morocco and Algeria. Uh, and in this context, uh, Bruce Lee, it, uh, it was considered like a bridge between uh, two people. And you have a lot of uh, uh, people if was funded uh, club, Bruce Lee clubs, uh, with uh, people from Algeria, from Morocco, from Tunisia, and it was ins uh, uh, instrumentalized and uh, its Jews uh, like uh, a, a cultural bridge. And uh, and more uh, in the context of 70s and uh, 80s in authoritarian uh, society. Uh, Bruce Lee was a model of uh, the, the wisdom of uh, Big Brother, uh, the brother, no, not Big Brother, brother, <laughs> not just uh, George Orwell, a brother, uh, a father, because it's uh, in hero. In this context, uh, the, the hero was dead or murdered by the state, by the police, and it's uh, a neutral hero, Bruce Lee. That's it. Thank you. Um, Okay, um, we did discuss Bruce Lee and I think, I mean, he is a classic Jungian archetype. I mean, there's the wizard, the king, the, the spiritual warrior, so it is very gendered, but it is a human archetype. Uh, the question, I think some of us are quite irritated by, felt like an adolescent provocation, oversimplification, um, because heritage is almost by definition the official legitimation of the pieces of the past we want to preserve. It's very rarely used by uh, everyday people and community groups unless something that they value is being threatened and then they def use the word heritage to define it, to claim it as, a, as something of value. And towards the end we were discussing, or you were saying about the, the debate about whether Europe's Christian heritage should be reflected in the official documents or whether it should be secular. And I suppose we didn't have a chance to finish that conversation, but the Europe clearly has a Christian heritage. The only reason not to include reference to it in an official document is that, that it would be seen as exclusive, which is the dark side. You could say there's a Christian and a secular heritage, but if you only put one in, then you're, you shift, the shadow shifts. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. I mean, 
We're talking about heritage, but we're also talking about memories, and maybe we should have made that a little bit clearer. Well, you and didn't make anything clear. You just said that it's this, this old... Yes, but her heritage relates to memories, and uh, memories more clearly express uh, the, uh, the, the, the dark side of history. And another way of posing that question would be to uh, ask whether those memories need to be encapsulated in, 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 in heritage today. How, how should the past be commemorated? Because the past isn't just you know, the official statements uh, of, of um, nations, but it's also composed of other things, including different kinds of memories. I mean, th this is why I'm, I'm interested you find it an adolescent question, because I think it cuts to the chase of the broader issue of cultural heritage and European identity. We're talking about inclusion. We're talking about creativity as well and where it comes from. To my way of thinking about the way the heritage industry works, not just in the UK, but throughout the world now, there's increasingly uh, mechanisms, policies that are in action which push past the sun of the carpet. It's become very convenient to rush ahead with heritage projects that don't address it. The, the example that we discuss in our paper is how the bicentenary of the slave trade is appropriated by new labour in the UK to make a uh, neo-colonial point effectively that actually Britain is still at the vanguard of saving the world from the evils of modern slavery. And that's precisely because I think there's not enough attention being given to dark heritage being a unifying element of uh, of European past. Well, just on that point, um, it's very interesting that the, the visit of the British Prime Minister to Jamaica has raised the question of restitution. Uh, reparation. Reparation. Yeah. Re yeah, restitution actually was a term that was used, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, so that, that, that's obviously a completely <laughs> unresolved question. But I think your argument... Um, may be on the light side, but it may not work. It, you know, I, I think, I think the, the problem of managing um, conflicting memories within a society and then producing some kind of reconciliation about it may be a big ask that is too much. Uh, let, let me just put that to you, because I, you know, I, I think it's a little bit like the idea of a transcendent identity. It's pretty well much the same thing, actually, that, that you, know, you can reconcile incompatible memories uh, in the way that you can reconcile incompatible interests. And I'm not sure about that. It's a very interesting point. I think I'm being inspired a little bit by Augusto and the case of Portugal but also worried by it, because he brought up, and I'll, I'll ask him to perhaps clarify this for, for everyone, the very interesting case of Portugal reinventing its heritage identity post Salazar. Um, and we now have a new regime, if you like, of memory, of public memory. And that's problematic, uh, even though there's a recuperation of um, a sense of identity and a sense of self. But perhaps you can elucidate. But just, just on that point. Um, I think, I think my voice will carry, but uh, just on that point, um, the thing about officializing memory and heritage is that it, you know it, it then invites a response at a later point. So you know, if one thing can be overturned in unforeseeable historical circumstances, another thing can be overturned. Now, that would be my. So I, I I tend to believe that the underlying dynamic. Um, works against that kind of conciliation over, over, over the long term. Um. Okay. Um, a, a very quick point then. Um, why in London do we have a bench which has Churchill and Roosevelt sitting next to each other and Stalin's not in the middle? You know, we, we have public memorializations only form a small part perhaps of the way publics perceive and engage with their um, histories and past, but um, we don't have the full public memorializations that we deserve or that attend to the truth. They're always partial. Can we come to you in a minute, just after I've asked uh, Augusto to, to make his point about the, the Lisbon? I think we should also move on to the okay. next question then, perhaps after that. Okay, uh, the point of it is that uh, in Portugal, as you all know, there was a very important 
change of regimes in 1974, one of the longest dictatorships in Western Europe was um, fall, and uh, a new democratic regime was founded. And my point is, uh, any of these regimes needed to build a consensus on the history, the heritage that is the testimony of the, this history, and the memories that perpetuate history. The, the authoritarian regime, the Salazar regime, did it in a very ideological way. There was a definition by state agencies and by the Catholic Church what was to be considered as national heritage and what was to be excluded from national heritage. What was a true uh, testimony of the Portuguese character or way of being and what has to be excluded from that uh, representation. Uh, in a democratic terms, it is evidently impossible to reply, to replicate this logic. But uh, in the Portuguese democracy, as in the European democracies, the cultural investment on heritage, the cultural reading of heritage, is uh, the current name for its ideological definition and use, and for its projection as a social consensus that is one of the pillars of the legitimation of the political regime. For instance, uh, since one of the most important and permanent dark sides of Portuguese history was colonialism, because Portugal was one of the first uh, European colonial empires in the 15th century and was the uh, last uh, European country to decolonize in 1975. Uh, so colonialism was transmuted uh, during the 80s and the 90s by uh, cultural and political institutions of the Portuguese democracy in a new uh, form, the so-called dialogue or encounter of civilizations, uh, projecting retrospectively Portugal as one of the first global nations because a small European and peripheral country in Europe was, uh, along with Spain, in the, in the front line of the so-called first globalization in the early modern times. And all the legacy, uh, the colonial legacy and the, the testimonies of uh, colonial oppression were uh, substantially revised um, in order to project a new image of Lusophony. Uh, the main legacy of Portugal would be uh, the language, the Portuguese, that is a global language spoken in four continents. The main outcome of Portuguese history would be Brazil and uh, the hybridity, uh, the message, message Brazil uh, represents. And, and the, the, the aesthetic uh, form um, that uh, symbolizes Portugal is the Baroque we see in Portugal, in Brazil, or in Goa, India. So this, is, this kind of metamorphosis, this kind of work on social memories and uh, on uh, heritage and heritage, heritage policy, that seems to me one of the main uh, arenas in which a regime, a political regime, uh, does effectively work and tries to disseminate through education, media, and ritual, uh, civic rituals, commemorations, uh, national days, national anthems, uh, national icons, and cultural forms. Uh, so there is always a dark side in uh, uh, identity, national identities. And there is also uh, work, a very important and um, from times to times very sophisticated work in trying to rereading uh, history. Um, and one of the main uh, um, elements that uh, uh, states use nowadays to, uh, to, to, to effect, uh, effect uh, that metamorphosis is uh, the idea that uh, some of uh, the testimonies, some of the forms 
are global, belonging to mankind, etc. Uh, Portugal and Spain joined the uh, then European Community, nowadays European Union, in 86. And it was a very important moment. It was the moment, uh, the, 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 the most important and long-lasting realization of the young Portuguese democracy. But equally important was 83, three years um, earlier, when the first Portuguese monument was uh, inscribed in the World Heritage List, Batalha. Uh, and this, this parallel can help us to understand how the politics function and how uh, the, the symbolic representation of the past and the constitutions of social memories about the past and the silences and voices that they project are crucial for uh, living together. Thank you very much. Do you still have a, a point at the back? You do? No? Yeah. Oh, you do? Okay. Um, if we could have it very briefly, that would be great because we need to hand over for the next question. Thank you. My question is, where does this take us, I guess? I mean, this is one area actually where I, I do know quite a bit. I've advised national museums in the US, New Zealand, Canada and South Africa. I've been intensely involved in the reconstruction of heritage post-94 in South Africa. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights, the Canadian Museum of Immigration, the European Parliament, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I have equally been involved in a number of local small museums and a number of monument building. Each of those instances has an incredibly different approach to memory and heritage and national identity, local identity, immigration, different people, etc. My worry about this question is that should we concede that yes, heritage only has a dark side, then what? We do away with it? I mean, regardless, any conversation we have about the past has a complex, is, is complex. And I think it, it just becomes extremely dangerous because then what? I mean, what, do we not have memory? Do we not have heritage? All heritage, all memory in a form that we can take in has been funded by somebody at some point. <laughs> whether it's the national state, the local state, whether it's private money, whether it's anything other than, than our photo albums in our, in our room. So any public heritage has been funded by someone and has a particular interest behind it. But what does that mean? You know, does that mean we don't do it? Sure, it can be co-opted by politicians, but, but what? So it's bad? I mean, <laughs> so to me, I guess the question is, what do we do, what do we, do? what is that question, where is this taking us to? As, as a practitioner and a stakeholder where this is absolutely a critical issue, this debate scares me, because then what? Then we have no museums, we no, have no heritage sites, we have what, no, we, ha we don't discuss heritage or memory? I would like to offer a very simple answer to your question because uh, it has uh, effective consequences. It's my professional responsibility of, of sociologists and sociologists of culture to combat against the, um, the attempt to transform the Portuguese or the Spanish or the French national history, including the colonial uh, period, into a sort of dialogue of civilizations, encounter of cultures, that is a very new colonial uh, perspective. Um, for instance, the idea that is very current in Portugal, uh, according to which the Portuguese is the language the Portuguese uh, gave to other people, and so the, Portu the Portuguese and Portuguese state as a sort of uh, ancestrality, uh, a sort of rights, a special rights on, uh, uh, for instance, issues of orthography of the Portuguese lang language is not only scientific faults, but uh, politically very uh, unacceptable, unacceptable. And it's my responsibility as a policy policymaker, a uh, role that uh, I also <laughs> uh, play, uh, to, uh, to, to take into account what history or sociology uh, tells me about uh, 
the darkness and the brightness of heritage, the, the plasticity and the dynamism of heritage, whenever I take decisions on museums, collections, monuments, uh, national days and ceremonies, and so on. It's, 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 cru it's a crucial issue, I think. Thank you. Lars, can we quickly have you? Yeah. I don't... I don't want to sound like Darth Vader, but I like the dark side very much. And I think um, I miss the dark side being in the, ne in the Netherlands and in many other countries also. I grew up in Germany and it gave me that, that, that conscious about the dark side of every part of the history of that country uh, gives me such a freedom of those terrible things which I see in the Netherlands and everywhere else, which yeah, is nationalism, exclusivity and so on. So I think that talking about the dark side is not something ne negative or throwing it overboard. It's, it offers us a lot of possibilities. Let's talk about the possibilities that it offers us. Because I completely agree with you. I absolutely 100% agree that we have to acknowledge that it always has a dark side. But what possibilities does that afford us? For instance, stop doing immigration museums and do migrations museums. Uh, stop doing uh, commemorations on the Portuguese contribution to global uh, history and uh, begin to think on uh, several contributions that crossed uh, and make together uh, history. Uh, stop uh, treating, for instance, the Iberian American organization to which Portugal, Spain, and all the Latin American belong as a sort of um, proof, contemporary proof of the uh, almost totemic role of Portugal and Spain for uh, one million, one uh, billion of people. Stop uh, treating the CPLP, that is the organization of Portuguese speak people, speaking people, to uh, contemporary proof of a sort of totemic role of Portugal uh, on Brazil, uh, in regarding Brazil, Angola, Mozambique. Such thing does not exist. But it's terrible to think in 2015 as it existed, that, at, as, uh, as it uh, Brazil or Angola or Mozambique were the offspring of Europe. They are not the offspring of Europe. They, they are the oppressive people of uh, European slavery and the slave trade and so on. <laughs> but I, Mozambique I needs to, absolutely, but Mozambique needs to be able to make its own stories as well. And Mozambique needs to be able to tell the story in its extremely poorly funded uh, museums and heritage institutions about its side of the story as well. I absolutely agree with you, but I think that, you know, conservative governments, I've watched it happen, conservative governments go for history museums. Left-wing governments go for ethnography or world cultures museum. Now you're seeing a huge movement that all the new museums being built are natural science museums and around life sciences and the future of the environment. These things are extremely interesting, but when we talk about the heritage, that doesn't really change. It's only our relationship with it that changes. And so the, the question then becomes, you know, the lens through which we see the past changes with every generation, with every discipline, with every idea we have towards the political reality that we're in. If, if there's one thing that's constant in that is that we know that that lens is going to change. And it changes all the time. So I guess, then what does that offer us? What, is that, what does that mean? Thank you. Uh, one of the things we discussed yesterday was identities, <coughs> memories in relation to narratives. And it was uh, suggested that one dimension of identities, both collective identities, individual identities, is that they are in some way uh, based on narratives. And uh, I think at some level memories can be seen as, uh, as narratives. So the quick, and, and then we, we, we discussed sort of normative dimensions of all of this. What, what kind of narratives of history uh, should be uh, in, encourage, encouraged with, with respect to how history should be commemorated, how, how the past should be commemorated, uh, how we should see 
uh, our heritage. Uh, one could uh, re relate that to um, national context, but I, I think what we have more in mind here is uh, Europe taken, taken as a whole. Um, so what kind of narratives of history should be encouraged uh, in, in Europe today? And, well, that's a question. I hope it makes sense uh, uh, to you. Uh, we, we did discuss you know, this notion of a, norm, a normative dimension, uh, what, what should be actively uh, in, encouraged, as opposed to um, taking for granted assumptions about the past, the grand narratives of European history, the, the, the um, grand narratives of national history, whether there are alternative conceptions of history uh, that could be at the basis of European cultural identity and, and the conception of European cultural heritage. So next question. This question makes sense. Yes. 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 My first reaction to the question is I'm uh, encouraged by the uh, produced by the Concluding um, question to post them, like any other issues related to heritage that anyone wants to raise, and particular stakeholders. Let me finish up. So they won't say in the end that something was just noted. If you was ideologue, what you can encourage in order to you make a role ideologically. Thank you.
It's an outsider, not recognized. Yeah. The, the state has a role of the power of the recognition. Yeah. And it's a fact, not a yeah. legitimation. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just a historian or not just a, a scientific method. Mm. You have a state, you have a, a, a public politic. Yeah, you have public responsibility to make good science, in fact. Yeah. It's part of the job of the, <coughs> the state. But the, the, the question of what kind of narrative it's it's problematic because what does it mean? I mean, you have, you have a, a lot of different narratives yes. of history. You have a classic narrative, uh, such as the blockbuster industry, and you have uh, narratives which are no more narrative, I would say. <laughs> You have micro story, you have your, your individual uh, pieces of micro story, and uh, you, you have a lot of uh, stories of objects such as uh, Lane McGregor uh, big book about uh, objects and uh, no more persons or no more uh, events, in fact, just objects of material culture of uh, history. So you have a lot of. Uh, um, what about the choice of a, a kind of history? I mean, what is the role of history? Yeah, like, yeah. like uh, all people, mm -hmm. when you are, uh, when you I mean, yeah. suppose that there is the European uh, house which yes. would be in charge of making a good uh, European history. And there will be a museum of a European history. Brussels, and it would be interesting to, to look at the result of <laughs> this museum. It's, it's, it's question is um, depend of the conception of intellectual. It's question is depend of uh, you have a ideological conception of intellectual working about the culture, about the kind of narrative of history. Or you have a modest, modest, modest point of view of intellectual. Uh, no, I, I'm not uh, encouraging a kind of narrative. It's perhaps it's a, the, the answer about this question. What kind of conception of intellectual you can have? Perhaps. But, uh, I think the uh, usefulness is uh, giving forward to the works of professional historians. Yeah. <coughs> uh, this one is, um, for me it's to, to be suppressed that uh, the narratives are plural uh, and comprehensive. Yes. We can't have any official narratives yeah, on the history of the country, country mm -hmm. the region of the city or yes. uh, civilization. Uh, because on the other hand, I think it is legitimate in certain circumstances that the political authority yes, yes. or the cultural yes. administration mm. encourage yes. certain narratives yes. of history and silence or disfavor. Other ones, mm. uh, for instance, there is a Museum of the Resistance mm. in East Timor, in yes. the Oil, uh, the first version of <laughs> that. The, the collection, the narrative yeah. collection was very uh, uh, 
It was true, but it was very hard towards the Indonesians as being built in Timor in 75 and against Portuguese who ran <laughs> uh, And uh, in the last year, the narrative was moderated. If you visit now the, the museum, uh, the, the, this narrative has been softened. And uh, it makes sense because, meanwhile, Timor and Indonesia, Indonesia uh, reestablished diplomatic relations, Portugal is the main provider of the way for cooperation. So, uh, in certain circumstances, for instance, in the Balkans or in the Middle East, people need to forget history <laughs> because uh, if we uh, continue to discuss if the Kosovo, because of the battle in the 13th century, is or is not a fundamental year for fights for the Serbian identity, you, you can't overcome the conflicts of the nations or remain a citizen. So, I would, I would respond in two phases. Yes. What the, the historians yes. deal with this in their way, and we can uh, discuss. Okay, everyone, maybe we, we continue now. We have a, a plenary session. Collect your, your comments. Where will we start? How about you? We concluded with you, I think. So let's start, let's start over there. They're a very quiet group. Sam. Sam's group over there. Okay, uh, have your, your attention, please. Who's going to sum up what you've what you said about this question of narratives, of desirable narratives of, of history? Yeah, over there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, I won't speak at length because um, I'm not I'm not directly involved. But just to give a synopsis of <laughs> uh, that's right. Okay, just to give a, a brief synopsis of, of um, what what we were discussing. Uh, well, one of the things we we got onto was to uh, in response directly to that question was that um, one one value one very valuable way of um, <coughs> deciding what sort of narratives should be brought up into, um, what well, should be encouraged, would be to look at um, narratives that, that um, advance um, societal justice or societal reconciliation in some way. And we were talking about the, the different truth commissions around the world. We were, I mean, we, we, brof we briefly spoke about the South African one. But what was interesting there was that people sacrificed the value of um, of punitive justice um, by deciding not to prosecute people who gave a full disclosure of their crimes. So you had um, you know, the real um, villains from, from the apartheid era um, confessing to all their crimes in, in great detail. And what was important was the, simply that they, they confess um, and that they, they give an accurate and comprehensive account of what they did. Um, they were then allowed to go completely free. Um, which, which nobody wanted to do, but everybody agreed that, well, most people agreed that there was a greater value in having um, what was previously just um, the object of speculation um, actually codified into some kind of uh, much more coherent official narrative of what, what, what actually happened and what kind of crimes were committed. So um, we're saying that those kind of narratives that, that, that were sort of occluded in speculation um, or just simply never recorded properly um, th th that's the kind of thing that, that perhaps deserves to be um, dragged up and, and, and sort of, sort of um, made much more official. So that, w that was one of the things we discussed. 
Um, Good. Thank you very much. Um, how about this group here? Um, we had a very short answer. <laughs> True narratives <laughs> should be encouraged. It was more difficult to find out when is a narrative true. And uh, we came up uh, with the idea maybe that all narratives should start with definition of the context in which they are written. Then we have a chance at least to judge whether they are true or not. And maybe the context changes during the uh, history of the history, and therefore then the true narratives will maybe also change. But we have at least a chance to evaluate, evaluate it and assess the truth of the narrative. Good, thanks for that. Yeah. Um, can we go to this group? Uh, we were uh, citing a few examples that should be encouraged as narratives, like, for example, the, the, uh, the recent trend in, in some parts of Poland where, where Jews have disappeared, we know how and why, and there is a kind of revival, turning back to memories of, of those people who are not there, but they, who contributed to to the, to, the, to the heritage of the place, of the, whether it is a village or a, or a town. Or the, the, another project, which is Via Ignatia, which, among others, went through Thessaloniki and there uh, gave justice to, the, to the, all the color, di uh, past uh, diversity of that place, whether <coughs> the, the Ottoman, again, the Sephardi Jews, or uh, uh, other past minorities. Uh, so this is the kind of attitude which should be encouraged against the narcissistic uh, simplification and sometimes aggression of the actual owners of the, of the, of the place or the, the actual inhabitants uh, who uh, well, expropriate or just forget about those who contributed to, to the memories of, of, of that uh, place and community. Good, thanks. Um, we'll go maybe back to this group here. Okay. So, uh, you know, André Gide said that uh, you can do very bad literature with good feelings. And I would say you can also write a very bad uh, history with good feelings. We have a lot of examples. For example, in the uh, French-Algerian uh, situation after the decolonization, uh, there was a famous uh, uh, historian of uh, Roman uh, archaeology and uh, Roman colonization of uh, Maghreb who wrote a, a, a history which was conformed to the post-colonialism, decolonization, and, and uh, 30 years after, uh, everyone knows it's uh, bullshit. And he, 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 he told the, very, the community, okay, it's, it's well, it was uh, purely ideological, but uh, full of uh, good feelings about uh, good Algerians and uh, bad Romans and so, so on. So, I, I, well, the question is, uh, what kind of narrative? Is it the narrative in schools? Is it the narrative of in, in a university? Is it the narrative of museums? Uh, we are very different narratives. And uh, returning to the previous discussion about museum, it seems to me that part of the answer is that uh, museum of are in democratic states, and most, uh, I hope, uh, European countries are democratic states. Uh, museums are funded by uh, public money, so by uh, politicians who have been elected. It's, uh, uh, of course, uh, linked to uh, the situation, uh, the political situation. 
and uh, we vote for people. So uh, perhaps we, we don't uh, have the same opinions as the rulers, but uh, they have been elected. So this is part of the of the political life. I mean, the, the change of a, a official narrative in museums. Another story is narrative uh, in uh, uh, libraries, in bookshops. There is a, a question of business of a, a successful histories or not su successful histories. You have a complete outsiders, historians, who uh, are becoming stars, are becoming master of narratives 30 years after. We discuss uh, some examples. So it's very complicated uh, notion uh, about also the autonomy of the intellectual. And uh, of course, sometimes the pursuit of truth, because as an historian, I, I think uh, it's old fashioned school, but the <laughs> notion of historical truth uh, can be an objective. Uh, so uh, I s my, I'm a bit afraid about an official history <coughs> of Europe, which could be uh, taught in every school in Europe, and uh, which would told in the, in the new uh, museum of uh, European history, which is supposed to be uh, settled in Brussels. It's, uh, uh, it's one of our uh, preoccupation here. Yeah, I can't help commenting that yeah, certainly no historian, more or less, I, I think it's fair to say, most historians, at least if not all historians, have, would shy away from anything like um, wanting to substitute what was once a kind of a grand narrative history of, of nations or a grand narrative of Europe uh, for, for something else because the past is too uncertain. Uh, for example, uh, um, Han, uh, Christian Meyer, the German historian, in, in a book called From, uh, From Athens to Auschwitz, said that should be really the narrative of European history, but even he uh, didn't go on to write that uh, history. There's too much uncertainty. But it does surely raise big questions about how then is something like European identity possible? Uh, if narrative is a dimension of identity, um, does it mean that the resulting European identity that we might end up with would be memoryless or something that doesn't have a narrative? Um, so I, I'm still suggesting the problem of, of, of narrative as we discussed yesterday uh, is still there. It's a question of which narrative but Sultan wants to add to that, and then we go to the next one. Uh, thank you, Gerard. Uh, if uh, I may add something, because it sounds very interesting, this discussion, and I, I uh, see a very clear link between this question and the previous one, and the discussion that we, what we had about heritageization and narratives of history. Uh, something uh, which was not really discussed uh, is that uh, when we talk about heritageization today, it sometimes seems to be quite an uncritical uh, creation of uh, heritage which lacks uh, the critical approach of history, although I would not pretend that uh, we cannot manipulate history in many, many ways, uh, but it had a certain tradition of critical approach and uh, the possibility to, uh, to be critical toward a certain historical narrative, uh, what we do not have uh, with regard to heritage. So heritage maybe it's my interpretation, started as a, uh, a counter uh, narrative of official history creating uh, heritage focal points of uh, given communities uh, in Western Europe. So it was a very democratic approach. Uh, I'm simplifying uh, uh, very much. Uh, but uh, today we can also see that the heritage discourse has become so omnipresent that it can be used for a completely uh, oppressive representation of history and different elements of that. So that's uh, why I, I found it very interesting, the uh, example of truth committees of uh, explaining the context of the different narratives. So I, I think, uh, well, it's my personal view. It would be very interesting not to have uh, a common European narrative. It seems to be impossible. But at least trying to have a multifocal uh, uh, addition of different narratives, which is not just adding up different national histories and uh, label it uh, as a, a European narrative of, of history. Uh, 
and on the first aspect of your uh, re remarks on history and heritage, uh, Francois Hartog has written a great book, that which will be familiar to many of you, Regimes of Historicity. Uh, I think it's an excellent treatment of, of that problem. Uh, Francois Hartog, yes. Regimes of Historicity. I think that's the... Um, Who was uh, our uh, invited guest speaker at one of our um, workshops on heritage so and history last year in Rome that we organized. Thanks very much. Uh, and the, I think it's the last group of time. Thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, the, I mean, the, the consensus among historians is that in the case of uh, conflictual interpretations of history and so forth, uh, um, uh, uh, an approach uh, uh, inspired to multi-perspectivity should be adopted. Uh, obviously, in the, at the right level of schooling and whenever that is pedagogically uh, possible. And this uh, uh, is uh, certainly possible with adolescents and uh, in adult uh, education, and there are examples. Uh, Multi-perspective history of the Baltic, of the Black Sea, uh, countries, uh, for instance, have uh, been uh, drawn up over the years with experts from all the uh, countries involved uh, uh, <coughs> over uh, a history of the p several past few centuries and uh, involving also some of the and, uh, uh, controversial uh, points. So that is not impossible. I think the question, which is a bit, little bit offsetting, uh, just as the first one, uh, perhaps would have been uh, better put if we had said what kind of narratives of history should be discouraged. And we would have agreed that you know, anything that is uh, malicious, manipulative, dishonest, or inciting uh, uh, violence, or, or uh, uh, so forth, uh, should be discouraged. And this explains uh, why, in certain exceptional situations, uh, moratoriums on the teaching of history have had to be decided, and I was involved in, in one in, the, in Eastern Slavonia. Five years after the war, no history in schools. And it worked very well. Better to have no history than, uh, than uh, uh, <laughs> bad, very but, but bad. Uh, it's easier to agree on what not to do then. Yeah, I mean, because what to do is obvious. Is, uh, I mean, again, the, the, uh, the question is as honest to provide a narrative that is as honest as possible, based on the best uh, evidence, which is as little manipulat manipulative as possible. And when this is doubtful, then to revert to multi-perspectivity and allow the learner, you know, to decide for himself <coughs> or herself. You know, what he will not decide on the truth, you know, but he will be he, w he will become aware of the complexity of uh, of uh, of uh, history of drawing up historical accounts. Thank you. Just to add a little thing, um, I'm s very much struck how um, the um, entertainment industry is transforming history um, in this kind of folklorization more and more on economical purpose. So there is also a, an economical dimension in the way history is rewritten or instrumentalized. And to put the question exactly uh, uh, as Gabriel said, what kind of narratives of history should not be encouraged? This is something, this is a political question here which is very important, especially at the time when Europe is bringing in a Creative Europe program that will be very much uh, uh, used by the entertainment industry and all these people. So there is a question. Uh, I think history is uh, at risk very much these days. And I think this creates a trauma, especially amongst young people, because they don't know exactly. I mean, there is a black hole in the back. and. They, at the same time, it's paradoxical, they believe what they see on the social medias, on, on the telephones, on the, on, on the global internet. At the same time, they know it's not true, that there is nothing to replace or to give to them a second lecture of their past. 
And I think this is extremely dangerous. But we have to fight very strongly because the economic interests behind that are huge, very much. And this is the control of the, uh, what is at stake is the control of the future uh, content industry that will be the biggest thing in the next 50 years, you know. So we are on a very, we are on the front line. It's history is not something to be discussed in living rooms, it's in salon and things like that. It's the front line. Thank you. Um, we need to move quickly so we can finish at 6.30. To the next question, which Mercedes is going to pose. 6.45, no? Oh, uh, so six, six, 6.45. Uh, at six, in that case, we have more time. Uh, take that one. Sorry. Um, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we, we will ask you to have a little bit more patience with us and bear with us for another 20 minutes, please. Um, the uh, third question that we wanted to ask is the one that you see right behind me. Um, I will not read it out for you. We're all literate here. Um, I uh, would like you just to think about Europe in terms of Europe, not the idea of Europe, but Europe as a project, as a political project. This is something that came up yesterday in the session a number of times. And against that background, maybe please, if you are willing, reflect rather than on the issue of diversity, on the issue of unity. Unity understood from a double perspective, within and without Europe. By within, I mean what unity in terms of a common set, sorry, a set of common values, beliefs, and views. And when we talk about without, meaning our unity as related to the others, to other regions of the world, keep in mind the ongoing debate today of the role of culture in external relations of the EU. So against that double background, please reflect on unity. And does it mean anything to you? Silence. May I make a comment? Maybe is that okay? Please. Yeah, it, it seems there's a, con there's a consensus today that Europe is about diversity, the diversity of nations, diversity of regions, uh, to which we can add the diversity of ethnic identities and uh, many, many more uh, such uh, cultural identities. Uh, that seems to be reflected in European cultural policy making in the last um, maybe 15 years or more. Uh, and that leaves uncertain the status of unity. So does unity only consist of the uh, fact of diversity? And thus the, there is no, uh, um, there's no unity. And that's of course related to the uh, earlier question whether there, are uni there is the possibility of European <coughs> uh, conception of history. So is, is unity to be sacrificed now uh, for, for diversity? And all we have is a unity uh, in diversity which in the end is just the simple recognition of diversity. Uh, if we accept the importance of diversity, does that mean we're giving up um, on unity and throwing it out? Uh, what does that have to say for commonalities, for, for the possibility of uh, a common identity, a common conception of history, or however you wish to, 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 to pose the dimension of commonality, of unity? Has unity been discredited altogether? Oh, yes, so, say, sorry? Are you encouraging working? Oh, so, yes, yeah, well, yes, yes, uh, of course. Um, as, it's our last question, but there's one uh, perhaps very um, brief final question of a general nature. <laughs> I'm not with the word today.
the will to live mean anything to you now? Uh, Not really. I went into Latin I think it's a US slogan. Yes, yes. There is a whole discourse on why this is different. <laughs> Because there is nothing that it comes out of. So you have to, as it goes in rather than comes out. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the classic problem of uh, the European uh, shifting towards a continuing expansion and the diversity, the diversity of the projects that the European project tries to deal with, like democratization. Portugal, Spain, and Greece, then post-communism in Eastern Europe. Um, so I mean, it's, it's um, and then of course the kind of going up to the boundaries of the Ukraine. You know, that's kind of a NATOization quite frequently, obviously. So um, sort of, I mean, it's, 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 it's never been about unity or cultural sense. Um, so political unity is questionable because it's not a state, it's a, weak, it's a sort of a weak um, steering mechanism for the election of states. So, what is more striking is the diversity, and, and then of course the, the several speeds, aren't there? With the, with the, basically, with the uh, Euro Europe is different, Schengen Europe is different. So we, you know, I mean, we all know this. I mean, there is, we have kind of a patchwork of arrangements, which, which, which is um, diversity, borders, diversity, economic systems, um, several, several speeds, knowledge, different levels of development. I mean, this is like. Um, so the first year exam question for a political science course. It's, um, it's the answer. Um, the only situation where this can make sense for me is the uh, Schengen Euro uh, area where you can uh, uh, move you have the same uh, currency. So this could be uh, an idea. Well, but coming to London, for example, it's an experience different. Yeah. Nothing changed for me uh, coming to London. It's the same experience as 30 years ago. Something different. I changed my currency, I, I am checked at the airport. <laughs> Very careful, very careful. <laughs> you got it? Yeah. Sometimes I can enter. From the issue.
Can I can I kindly ask you to interrupt the narratives? Okay. And can I maybe ask some of whoever wants to start this time? Not, does somebody want to volunteer? Oh wow. Oh, great. As long as it's fresh in my mind, I think we didn't get well to any done. conclusion, but um, 
we talked a bit about the political uh, meaning of the statement of unity at, at a certain moment where it has a geo had a geopolitical meaning also, and maybe it is now today challenging us uh, to think about uni unity in terms of uh, overcoming nation states and towards a real federation. Um, and um, at the same time, we had um, very concrete examples like uh, passports where formerly uh, the language, the original born country and the actual living country is noted so that a unity and diversity is really uh, tangible in the citizenship. Um, I had to think about the Bologna process in the arts in which I was, uh, in education in which I was centrally involved where the art schools 10 years ago said it's absolutely impossible to compare a degree done in Barcelona with a degree done in London. And now we really positively embraced the concept of transparency which allowed us to unify without giving up the diversity and maybe uh, that's a, a process I know we all, we, we all uh, we're in agony during the Bologna process, but um, maybe it's, it's a model, uh, a benchmark to think about for, for culture also, um, to compare processes and forms rather than contents and, and look for unity there. Um, so our, our, you, you can see our conversation was all over the place. Uh, we didn't <laughs> get anywhere. Political unity is easier uh, than cultural unity. Exactly. So, so cultural basis for a federal Europe. Um, <laughs> um, Antonio? Only one sentence that I take from my group, and if you want, you can uh, interpret when you want. But uh, the sentence for me is a uh, unity in diversity means flexibility. And uh, I think that is uh, my only consideration from uh, Ferdinand and uh, all my groups that I can uh, put in common with you. Everywhere. Okay, right. Jordi, you, come on. I just I just visited the website of the Valle de los Caídos. Wow. Does for everybody know what the Valle de los Caídos is? For those who do not. Okay. No. No. The, I see something in television. The, they, they don't know Jordi. The Valle de los Caídos is a monument uh, around 50 kilometers northwest of Madrid, where Franco, the dictator, is buried and where thousands of Republican prisoners died in building that fascist monument. I saw the website now just a few minutes ago and it, it presents itself as monument for the reconciliation. And I would not be surprised if the monument could be presented as a unity in diversity monument. So. I, I celebrate the motto, I like it very much, but it is sometimes used by, by those who won to oppress those who lost. And this in Europe, I believe, is unacceptable. Uh, yeah, that's tangential way to answer the question. Okay. The gentleman over here? The gentleman over here? Yes, you? <laughs> oh, thank you. What a privilege. Um, well, uh, we, we don't really think too much of the slogan. Um, what we're struck by is Europe's diversity, continuing diversity, its weak political identity, the uh, distinctiveness of a monetary system that excludes many states or states that wish to be excluded, um, borders like the Schengen arrangement which are asymmetrical within the European space, the uh, 
the diverse reasons for accession by successive uh, states over the period of the European community's existence, then European Union's existence. Um, so we're, we're, we're struck by diversity, uh, which we think is inevitable, and um, that is, if you like, looking at it from the interior. Uh, from the exterior, if you were looking at the European Union, you would see diversity, incoherence, uh, political, lack of political will, lack of the instruments for effecting political will. And um, we're extremely doubtful about uh, any sort of idea of an, over, an overarching culture, which is not to say that there have not been cultural exchanges that are of a valued kind, uh, but at the same time, I think that expresses our opinion here uh, some time after 6.30, uh, <laughs> when all good people should be going to have their tapas and not talking about this topic. Thank you. Is that why you're so depressed, Philip? Not at all <laughs> depressed. That's me on an upside. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I could feel you sliding away uh, in the chair. <laughs> and... Uh, Peter or Cornelia? Cornelia, come on. We, we didn't hear before. You, we didn't hear be you before. So. Uh, we, we lost our director of the museum. <laughs> Sorry. He was so, supposed to speak. So, hmm? Ah, you can speak, right? Uh, I'm not sure, but, but what we discussed in this context was what we had in our debate earlier already, namely that there are those two parallel things to recognize in this context, which we found is a more or less empty issue, or if I understood the debate right. Namely, the parallel is um, uh, the democracy and the technocracy, which is operating even in our regions in very different uh, political and economical settings. And uh, the problem we have just now is to address the real issues, namely the so-called invisible hand behind. So this was what we discussed. We, we accept that, that the power of that principle presupposes democratic power. So unity and diversity means that the component parts are represented in the total part. And therefore the principle of democracy is embedded in that unity and diversity thing. However, what we're also increasingly aware of is that as a project, Europe enshrines democracy, but then overrides it with technocracy, which negates the actual force and will of the democratic process. So in a sense, this slogan doesn't actually reveal what Cornelia called, which is the hidden hand of democracy, of technocracy that is in fact determining what is possible within democracy. And, and that's a problem. So as a consequence, while it's meaningful to us, it's not, in a sense, um, relevant because the real force overrides it in an invisible but ultimately determinant way. I just want to add something about what Beppe said because Beppe un unfortunately disappeared, <laughs> our museum director, and uh, he f he saw that uh, the museum space as a continuing uh, space of d debate about these issues. So it was a it was not anything at any point do you say there is unity in diversity, but it's a continuing process of debating and opening up new spaces. So you reconstruct and construct and deconstruct uni unity moments, which it, just in order to see then to deconstruct them again. And he said that was partly the role in his museum to open up that space. Is that right? Yes. Did I get it right? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay.
Okay, so uh, um, I think Luca wants to bounce just, back on Just a question, because I am not sure I understood well. You're opposing technocracy to democracy in your thing. But so how do you define technocracy? Who are you referring to at European level? Just, just for understand. Can you refer to the 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 uh, reason for um, raising the issue was our debate about um, artistic creativity and uh, in the background the the system who is promoting currently art and culture in Europe and that there are um, indicators, not indicators in a specific technocratic sense, but there are issues which, um, uh, how to say it, which promote um, um, not diversity, but a homogenization of artistic expressions. So this was uh, behind the, uh, the, 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 our debate on technocracy uh, at a specific level, so. Which is why, why do you, do you, why do you blame technocracy for this outcome? That's what, that's my point. I don't understand why you blame technocracy for this outcome. No, you don't blame technocracy. Technocracy, I'm technocracy. I'm saying you're blaming yeah. technocracy yes. for this outcome. I mean, you, you have a situation like uh, some people are elected to discuss and determine and debate creativity and culture, but then when they enter into the scenario, this is how you reported it to me at least, I was told that, in fact, no, you're not to create the questions, you are to be a service provider to the answers that we prov ask you. So the we in this group is the technocrats and the democratically elected representatives... I think this is a distortion of what happened in a, at European Union level, but... Well, then no. I'll give you another example. This no, is not a distortion. I'm, I'm not saying that there's, I, no, I, there's not an issue, the technocratic issue, but I think this is a simplification which doesn't account of the, of the real complexity of the things there. Well, uh, The point, the decision at European level are made by be compromises between national member states. That's the point. Okay, and commission is just representation of a stupid balance between member states, even the way it is composed, because the commission is composed on the basis of the fact that each national government candidates someone. So the reality is that the European Union is not a union, because it's a simpler coalition, it's, an, it's a supranational organization that is a coalition of member states. All fall down, you know, all fall out of this basic mechanism. Then there is an issue, the issue is that the, you know, the, 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 initiative, the legislative initiative is only in the end of the commission. And as a result, you have a process where being the council in, you know, hand, in, in having the ownership of the budget and being the one that directly, indirectly appoint the commission, the commission come out with legislative proposals that only reflect the compromise between member states. But this is nothing that has technocracy. This is politics. Then you have then you have all the interpretation after that, which is as all bureaucracy in every country have, no? they, they do honestly mostly bad things because of the way, but the bureaucracy works because there is political pressure. Mm -hmm. And I think the issue is the fact that the society is incapable to generate a political pressure on these issues at, on the political level. So blaming technocracy for these kind of things, it, it to me it tends to simplify a situation which is not that but simple. But you just described a, a dynamics. I interrupt, I'd say, and I don't think I'm, I'm not from Barcelona, and I get angry with people who are from Arturo, what time is the performance? Eight. 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 We must be there at eight. Okay. Yeah. You're the boss, so you have to tell us when we have to close. Well, now is the time. I mean, we're we're, uh, uh, we're not actually late. It's no. we're on time. Um, no. 
<laughs> so maybe we can keep our levels of anxiety a bit lower. We're on time. Um, if uh, Jared allows me, I think that um, it's a very interesting conversation. Maybe we can continue it. But possibly it was what we had in mind when formulating this, this question, the issue of how do nation states eventually, possibly in a future, relinquish part of their power to a potential supranational instance? That is the, let's say, core of the debate, nothing else in political terms. Um, so on this note, thank you very much. You've been very brave. And uh, we follow you the leader? I don't know follow you to the theater or we meet over there? I think that everybody needs to have a little bit of logistics. Okay, so the instructions are that we all meet at the Mercat de las Flores at eight o'clock and that each of one of us goes however they wish. Metro, taxi, okay? Lars. In you or no, no, another no, no. anxiety? No, no, not a, yeah, another ex anxiety, but I think it's, it's um, I can also do it in private, but I think it concerns all of us, um, at least the stakeholders. I've been talking to the other stakeholders and practitioners to find out what our role actually is here, other than being critical, which we are, of course, luckily, um, happily providing uh, that role. Um, but are we here on a punctual basis this moment? Do we come back? Do we engage in a process? What do we get out of it other than putting in? Um, if that would be clear, the way I am critic um, can be different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I he hear that from others. I've, I've reading all the material meanwhile, so I'm through it, yes. But I didn't, didn't get my head around the process, really. Do you want me to answer, Arturo, or would you like you to answer that? Okay, so I take it on myself that tomorrow yeah. I come up with a proposal, I mean, with our idea of how you are seen in this process. Okay, point taken. Thank, Thank you. you